He's going to draw upon his experience as a physician and scientist at Johns Hopkins, where he's now Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics. When on the active faculty, he held joint appointments in the Departments of Epidemiology and Health Policy at the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Tony is author of several works of historical fiction, including the Adirondack Trilogy and the Bethune Murals. And I am proud to say that Tony Holtzman calls me his muse. And there's, he's the only person that's ever given me that title. So I, I um, always enjoy reading what Tony um, writes and having a chance in the summertime to sit down and talk about his books. And, and uh, every now and then I help with a word or two. So I didn't help at all with this one, I don't think, because it's, it's totally over my head. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to hand it off to you, Tony. And if you all wouldn't mind um, muting, that helps the audio. You can turn off your camera if you like. Um, Tony's going to share his screen. So um, and then we'll all have a chance to ask some questions. If you have questions along the way that you think of, feel free to type them in the chat bar and we will get to them at the end. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Amy. Uh, Amy surprised me when uh, she expressed interest in uh, what I've been doing uh, related to COVID-19. And I guess I sort of get so involved with day-to-day uh, -day work um, related to COVID-19 on my study of it. And I'm sure you are the same, that we're so busy learning new ways of coping with living under COVID-19 that we sometimes forget that we're living history at the same time. And uh, that uh, we're also, uh, in many respects, making history in terms of how we deal collectively with the COVID-19. But Amy didn't forget. I mean, she's head of historic Saranac Lake. And uh, I'm grateful for her, to her for giving me this opportunity. Um, our country, as I'm sure most of you know, has the most cases and the most deaths from COVID-19 uh, of any country in the world, about 215 countries. Uh, we also have among the highest cases per capita and cases and deaths per capita as any country in the world. And the question occurs to you as it occurred to me, how can it be that the wealthiest country in the world and among the most technologically advanced countries in the world can fare so badly. Uh, and that's the question that I wanna address today. How could we fare so badly? And, and a related question of could we have done better? Now, before I begin, I wanna show you uh, a couple of words. Just remember these two for now and we'll play this game as we go along here. Um, so, uh, how is it that the wealthiest country can fare so badly? Well, I think that there's an answer right there because while we are the wealthiest, we certainly don't distribute that wealth equally. And uh, you've heard these figures before, 1% of the population owns about 40% of the nation's wealth. Another way of looking at that uh, is that um, it would take the average worker in one of the 50 top companies with the most disparity between their CEO's salary and the average worker's salary, it would take the average worker a thousand years to make what its CEO makes in one year. So there's tremendous disparity in wealth and this shows in the fact that if you look at leading the major minorities, African-Americans and Hispanics, they have three times roughly over the nation, the case rate, the number of cases per capita as non-Hispanic whites and four times as many deaths. Um, so the inequality really does reflect itself in the nature of 
who gets COVID-19 and who doesn't. And it's not surprising in this audience when I ask those who had signed up by that time, how many have had it, that very few have had contact, direct contact with somebody with COVID-19. So um, we're fortunate and I don't think we should ever forget how fortunate we personally are. <clears throat> now, so that's one, inequality is one reason. Another reason which actually spreads over the whole world, of course, is this virus itself. Uh, it makes it extremely difficult for any country to deal with it because it is extremely infectious and lethal. Uh, so that it presents particular challenges that many past uh, epidemics have not. And I think a third uh, factor, unique, very unique to the United States is the still current federal uh, administration uh, that President Trump over the course of the last almost year has denied there was a problem, has uh, disagreed with many of his health advisors about the need for masks, about the need for self-distancing, and um, has himself uh, become a, uh, infected with the virus, but because he is among the wealthiest, he had, of course, the best care and care that was not open to many other Americans who have suffered from COVID-19. Now, let's turn to a little more particular aspects of this, uh, and particularly, trying to find out who's infected and who isn't infected. And traditionally, this has rested with uh, the Centers for Disease Control formed after World War II, who is sort of the first line of responding in the United States to uh, epidemics and pandemics. And the past it has done very well, most recently uh, with the Zika virus, and with uh, the Ebola viruses, which were very minor outbreaks in this country, particularly Ebola, but where CDC very promptly developed a diagnostic test, developed a means of isolating cases, and with local and state health departments was quickly able to contain those particular epidemics. And it was the assumption that they would do it here too uh, with COVID-19. So let me do a little fast chronology. At the beginning, towards the middle of January, the Chinese who had had the Wuhan pandemic uh, before us, before it got to the United States, um, they released the sequence of the coronavirus, COVID-19 virus, uh, to other countries in the world. And that enabled other countries to do two things. The first was to use that sequence to develop a test for the virus. And the second uh, was to develop a vaccine. And I wanna talk about CDC's role in developing a test for the virus. Now, before CDC or any other organization, public or private, could distribute a test for the virus to the public, um, it had to get the approval of the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Uh, and this was facilitated since a law passed by Congress in 2004 that established the situation where FDA could issue an emergency use authorization. I'm gonna come back to that term again and again, EUA, emergency use authorization, uh, when it needed to get in this case, a test for the virus uh, out to the public very quickly. So on January, but to do that, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, HHS, had to issue, had to proclaim a national health emergency. Well, Secretary Azar uh, issued such a proclamation on January 31st, saying that uh, an EUA would be, EUAs would be issued for a test for the virus. And on February 4th, actually FDA, so that was three days later, FDA issued 
the first EUA emergency use authorization for the virus to CDC. Now, um, CDC had already, once it had received the sequence from China, had begun work on the test. And by the beginning of February, uh, between February 4th and February 8th, it had distributed a test kit using what you're now familiar with, RT-PCR, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, uh, a platform that had been available for over 20 years to uh, develop a relatively quick test for the virus. And it had distributed initially to health department laboratories around the country. Now, to their credit, before health department laboratories started to use the kit to detect the disease in patients, they used the internal controls that were sent along with the kit to make sure that the test was working properly. And 24 of the 26 laboratories that did this discovered that the test was not working properly, that it was giving positive results using um, control specimens that did not contain the virus. And very quickly, it became apparent that the kits that CDC had sent out were contaminated with the virus, probably because in manufacturing in CDC, uh, there was some carelessness about coming close to another laboratory that was actually handling the virus itself. Um, so the tests were returned to CDC, CDC withdrew them, fortunately, before any patients had been tested. And while there's concern in some quarters, quarters that the CDC failure uh, was instrumental in leading to the um, explosion of tests, uh, the explosion of COVID-19. I don't believe that's the case, and we can come back and discuss that some more. Um, at any rate, it took CDC 20 days, uh, less than three weeks, to come up with a clean uh, test, a test that was uh, valid, could distinguish true positives from false positives, and same for negatives. Um, and make it available. In the meantime, and I think that the uh, Trump administration had part of it, certainly the FDA did it, the FDA began to issue EUAs, emergency use authorizations for uh, other laboratories, primarily commercial manufacturers, manufacturers of the test kit and um, uh, laboratories, Quest, for instance, who wanted to use the test to develop the test for their own use in their own laboratories. And um, it turns out that very rapidly, companies and others, a few other health department laboratories and a few research laboratories applied uh, to FDA for emergency use authorizations. And I wanna show you, if I can get it up here now, um, what this letter authorizing them looked like. <clears throat> so this is a sort of a sample of a standard letter that FDA issued, uh, that FDA used when it informed a company or laboratory that it had received an issue, an emergency use authorization. So this was a letter that was sent to Robert Redfield on February 4th, or it looked like, it, like this. This is, this is an, an actual quote from the letter. Um, but um, the CDC with Dr. Redfield as its director was informed by FDA, I have concluded that the emergency use of your product need, meets the criteria for issuance of authorization for the test. And the, the um, criteria for issuance of authorization, and here I've not included this, but I'll tell you that it essentially uh, said, you, um, we have an emergency on our hands and your product seems to meet the criteria for uh, issuance of authorization. Now, there was a third part 
of this letter. And it's called a waiver, a waiver of certain requirements. And let me get this changed here so I can. Uh, I am waiving FDA commissioners today. I'm waiving the following requirements for the CDC RT PCR diagnostic panel during the duration of this EUA colon. This is what is being waived. In other words, if you're going to manufacture or make a test available, oh, sorry about that. If you're going to make the test available, you don't have to follow the following requirements. You don't have to follow good current good manufacturing practice requirements, including the quality system requirements under the federal code with respect to the design, manufacture, packaging, labeling, storage, and distribution of your product. In other words, whether CDC had read this waiver or not, and I doubt that they had, it's sort of boilerplate, and this waiver appears in every uh, EUA that FDA has issued until today in making uh, companies allowed to issue the test, over 200 of them. Um, but whether they did or not, this is exactly where uh, CDC failed. They did not use good manufacturing practices uh, in making the test and that led to the contamination and to the short delay. And most importantly of all, to this explosion of interest by private firms uh, to get in on the business of testing for uh, the virus. Now, what were the consequences of that? Um, well, let me go, before I go on to the consequences, let me tell you how FDA made it worse. So they had issued these EUAs that were being issued in a steady stream. But in addition, at the end of March, this is a press release from FDA, they went even further. And the press release reads that the FDA recognized the urgent need for even faster testing availability. To respond to this need, the FDA revised the process to allow labs to begin testing prior, prior to FDA review of their validation data. They didn't have to show the FDA any data. This policy change was an unprecedented, this is the words of FDA, this policy change was an unprecedented action to expand access to testing. In addition, the FDA implemented another change to empower states to take responsibility for tests developed and used by laboratories in their states, their respective states, without FDA review. I mean, all restraints on proving, on, on making sure Americans were uh, being tested with a safe and effective test uh, were, were thrown to the winds. Now, what was the result of this? Now, um, you've seen slides like this, but let me sort of walk you through. There are really three or four parts to this slide. You see here in the background, these vertical bars, uh, which are the number of tests available in the United States from the end of March through to last week, it gets updated daily. And you see here, looking at these, to me, their faint bars in the background, that this is 1 million here, 1 million daily tests. And you see that by October, uh, September, October, we have exceeded in the United States, 1 million tests per day. So um, with over 200, organizations having the ability to test people, it's not terribly surprising that the number of tests did increase. In that case, the FDA accomplished that goal. But along with that, it was not particularly effective. So let's turn to this solid line here in blue. And you see that in April, um, it, the first time it's measured is the end of March, it peaks rapidly. The um, number, this is the number of, the percentage of positive tests among all tests per day. 
And you see it spikes very high and reaches about 23% uh, in April and then falls. Now, this is positive tests per day. Why, so at the peak here in April, 23% uh, were positive. Now that's extraordinarily high for a test like this when you're surging through a population. And the reason was, as you may recall, it seems like ancient history now, that testing in most parts of the country was limited to people who had, who were sick. Uh, and at first it was not exactly clear what the particular, whether there were particular features of COVID-19 that made the diagnosis relatively easy, easily without a test. Uh, but as we went along and learned more, the frequency of difficulty breathing, the possibility of losing the sense of taste, uh, the almost usual, pre the usual presence of fever, that we began to be able to understand who was gonna get, who got, uh, who had COVID-19 based on their symptoms. But an even more important reason was that as this peak began in April, we became aware of the fact that people who were asymptomatic, who had not had any symptoms of COVID-19 and did not develop, most of them, any symptoms of COVID-19, were spreading the infection. And that now it's well clear that over half of new cases of COVID-19 uh, came from people who were asymptomatic and communicated the virus to others who did become symptomatic. So as this becomes apparent, we begin slowly to test people who are asymptomatic and consequently the number of positive, the percentage of positive tests falls very steeply. Now, if uh, we had been effective in curbing the epidemic and curbing the number of infections, the frequency of infections. This curve, as happened in a couple of countries, including China, should have stayed flat, but it didn't. And this again is a reflection of where, despite the large number of tests, we failed to contain the epidemic. And it's um, pretty clear that the reason was not primarily because of mistakes in the test, although with 200 labs testing, there were mistakes among the tests. But it's because we did not have as a policy and a rigorously, uh, a rigorous policy of doing what's called contact tracing, of using a positive test result as an index that could be used to identify other people in person in contact with that infected and test positive individual to try and isolate them uh, so that they would not in turn infect others. So this contact tracing uh, was not done with any great enthusiasm or uh, uh, magnitude in the United States, whereas had been the key to other countries, including China, South Korea, uh, New Zealand, together with things like uh, masks and um, lockdown to have curbed the epidemic. But in this country, uh, as I've said already, President Trump and others in his administration was giving a mixed message. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> with the emphasis on um, uh, the number of the, the fact that there were now tests out there that they weren't always working very well, that uh, we really faced a disaster. And at the end of March, by the end of March in the Atlantic, the story appeared and I'll quote it directly, our reporting has unearthed a new coronavirus testing crisis. Its main cause is not the federal government, not state public health labs, but the private companies that now dominate the country's testing capability capacity. Testing backlogs have ballooned, slowing efficient patient care and delivery, and delivering a heavily lagged view of the outbreak to decision makers. In other words, the lagged view being that we couldn't even uh, contain the epidemic despite the large number of tests. So let me pause now and play the first version of the memory game. 
and ask you, um, I, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Uh, if you can tell me, uh, if you can unmute yourself, anybody who wants to, you can all shout it out. Does this remind you of one of the words at the beginning? Anybody, I'm waiting for an, an answer. Fair. Say fair. Fair. Let's say fair. fair. Thank you. I Very good. Socialism. Did somebody say, let's hold up. So let's say fair is what I heard first. I don't know. Uh, we'll come back to the socialism maybe later. Socialism. Okay, so um, somebody say multiple companies doing the test. Well, I don't want to get into an argument now. <laughs> Semantics of this. So we'll come back to that. Um, so that's essentially how we failed. That's essentially how we, we failed to uh, cope with um, diagnosing the test. My phone will stop in a minute. Um, sorry about that. So the test continues to this day. We've been through a spring surge. We've been through a summer surge. I hope you can. This is one of the problems of, uh, I, I don't know how, I guess I can unplug my phone. Uh, sorry. Uh, so we've been through surges and we haven't contained the epidemic. We haven't contained the pandemic in the United States. A few other countries have. So let me turn now to the vaccine. Uh, and it's really quite different the way the federal government, Trump's government handled the vaccine compared to the way it handled the PCR test for the virus itself. Uh, for one thing, it did not rush to issue EUAs and it established something called Operation Warped Speed, Warp, I sometimes add an ED, which is not correct. Operation Warp Speed uh, to develop a vaccine in the quickest possible time. And it has been remarkable, remarkably successful, but how it has succeeded is quite uh, instructive in uh, showing us what went wrong or recognizing what went wrong with trying to, uh, with the way the government had developed a test, the RT-PCR test for the virus itself. So before any emergency use authorization for the vaccine could be tried. Um, companies and research laboratories, usually in combination, had to uh, perform randomized clinical trials of their particular putative vaccine uh, to prove its effectiveness uh, and to somewhat lesser extent, its safety. Um, and they had to do this uh, with at least 30,000 subjects in the trial, uh, divided between those who would receive the vaccine blindly without knowing, that is without knowing that they're receiving the vaccine and an equal number who would receive a saline, an injection of saline control. Um, <clears throat> In addition, uh, and this is where the pharmaceutical companies come in, in partnership with research labs, they had to have the manufacturing capability to scale up to provide very large millions of doses of the vaccine uh, if it proved effective in the randomized trial. And as you know, uh, Pfizer and Moderna uh, had both succeeded remarkably um, there's no question that this was a, a tremendous um, scientific feat. I think one of the things to Operation Warp Speed's credit was they realized, unlike 
uh, the test for the virus where RT-PCR was already available modality platform for the test, that there was no certainty about what type of vaccine would succeed in immunizing people against the virus. And among the first batches, uh, two different technologies or two different uh, scientific bases for the test were used. The one by Moderna and um, Pfizer used a uh, mRNA, messenger RNA, as the active ingredient to induce immunity in people being vaccinated. Whereas AstraZeneca used a much more traditional form of using, constructing a DNA uh, model of the virus, which was the basis for the vaccine. And there was no assurance uh, that either would work. Um, and the criterion for success was that in the trial, the, that the group that was vaccinated, the subjects who were vaccinated, had to have at, at least 50% fewer infections than a control group. Uh, in other words, they had to have um, at least 50% protection from the vaccine itself to be considered success. And as it turns out, as you know, both Pfizer and Moderna had about a 90% effective rate comparing vaccinees to controls. Uh, so there's no, this was a remarkable accomplishment. Um, what I wanna show you um, is, uh, well, before, let me just say a word about safety. Safety in terms of what are the side reactions and you know very quickly that there were a few immune reactions. I myself have hesitated, I'm more than eligible age-wise to get the vaccine. I haven't gotten it because I've had an anaphylactic reaction uh, to bee stings many years ago. And more recently, uh, while in Saranac Lake, had a very near miss with developing severe angioedema, another type of allergic reaction uh, to an ingredient close to one of the ingredients that might be in the vaccine. So uh, I've hesitated to get the vaccine because I'm pretty well isolated, but anyway, uh, and, and I don't mean, I, I think that people who have allergic reactions and I myself, I'm sure, will um, have the vaccine pretty soon. In the meantime, um, I wanna turn to the financing of uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Oops. Where am I? This shouldn't have happened. So this is a fact sheet explaining Operation Warp Speed. Remember, this was the operation under which the vaccine was developed and is now being distributed. Uh, so this is again a quote from official HHS Health and Human Services document. And it's a sort of a chronology of things that happened and there are many, some dates before and others afterwards, but I picked out these two. July 22nd, this is 2020. HHS announced up to $1.95 billion in, excuse me, <clears throat> in funds to Pfizer for the large scale manufacturing and nationwide distribution of 100 million doses of their vaccine candidate. The federal government will own, will own the 100 million doses of vaccine initially produced as a result of this agreement. On August 11th, HHS announced up to $1.5 billion in funds to support the large scale manufacturing and delivery of Moderna's investigational vaccine candidate. Under the terms of the agreement, the US government, federal government, will own the resulting 100 million doses of vaccine. And I could scroll down further and show you that HHS had signed similar agreements in terms of the government owning their respective vaccines for Novavax, Sanofi, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson, each for 100 million doses of the vaccine, which the government would own. Um, so let me again pause uh, and ask you to play the memory game again. 
I hope we can have more consistency this time. What does that remind you of? Unmute and let's hear somebody say. Socialism. Okay, thank you, Fran. Socialism. Uh, I'm not going to ask for anybody else. <laughs> and well, it's close to socialism, isn't it? With the government owning the vaccine. Now, that's not the same as say Marxist socialism, where the government owns the mean of, means of production. Uh, but this is the government owning a major product and being able and responsible for um, distributing that vaccine among the people. This is not a re something that um, Pfizer or Moderna or soon AstraZeneca will have to do. It's being that particular and very expensive fee is being handled by US taxpayers in both states and uh, federal government. So um, that sort of raises an interesting question as to turning again these two words, two extremes of economic policy where you have laissez-faire on the one hand uh, with essentially what is the essence of a free market with minimum government control and on the other hand, the U.S. government under Donald Trump undertaking to own the vaccine and take the responsibility for distributing it. Now I have to say, because I'm sure somebody will ask me about the Pfizer, Pfizer did not accept money for help in developing the vaccine. Moderna did, and many of the other companies, pharmaceutical companies did. So they got help in distributing in manufacturing the, the vaccine so it could be distributed in large amounts. Um, so they've done very well. In fact, if you look at, uh, if you do the arithmetic between um, uh, 100 million doses of the vaccine available uh, for let's say $2 billion, which is what the ratio works out to, that's $20 a dose that the government has paid to the companies for um, distributing, for manufacturing, for manufacturing the vaccine. Uh, well, that's more than the cost to the companies of manufacturing the vaccine. So they've made a profit already, despite the fact that Americans will not be charged for the vaccine. The companies have been paid off quite well for what they've done. Uh, uh, for the government, uh, for the people of the United States thus far. So I want to conclude um, just by raising, I think, a, a, a question that we have to consider as we go into the future, because there is no doubt, uh, scientists agree on this, that it's only a matter of time before there will be another virus, whether it will be as infectious or as lethal as COVID-19. Uh, we don't know, but um, considering the global nature of our world uh, today, it sounds like a tautology, um, there's no doubt that there will, we will be infected again and have to deal with this again. And the question is, in a democratic society where there is dissent allowed, where people can, uh, within broad limits, uh, behave the way they want to. I'm thinking about not wearing masks, of traveling, of ignoring uh, the restrictions on travel, uh, where they can refuse to take a vaccine or refuse to get a test. Is an interesting question of whether and how uh, we could contain a future virus. And I think looking at these two examples that I've given you today, how we have failed to contain the virus by our testing policy, and particularly the lack of contact tracing. And on the other hand, where the government did step in and own the and owns the vaccine, whether there is a um, middle way that would work. And I think the failure of uh, EUA points to that, and that is a failure of regulation. That this went overboard in trying to get tests out there quickly to lose sight of how tests could have helped contain the epidemic. So I, I leave you with this question of, you know, can we avoid the fiasco of trying to contain COVID-19 in the United States when the next epidemic comes around? Thank you.
So I'm done. Uh, I hear seat clapping. That's a good sign. <laughs> Can we ask questions, Tony? By all means, yes. Uh, today's announcement that um, the FDA is basically brought on to Biden's um, plan to quickly vaccinate as many people as possible uh, and then try to make sure that uh, manufacturing ramps up so second shots will be available even if they're a little late. Is, is there any evidence that um, manufacturing will be able to ramp up enough time if we uh, greatly expand the number of people getting the first vaccine shot? Thanks, Alan. Um, that's a, sort of a controversial question. I think the question, if I can rephrase it is, should we start to give first doses uh, in, to, to new people, people who have not been, have not received any dose before we give the second dose to people who received the first dose? Is that the question? Is that a fair? Uh, Pretty much, is, is it a good policy? Yeah. Well, it's hard to say, and it is a, it's a problem of science here. I mean, because the people who have, who have disputed uh, and I don't know. I don't know the answer. I have to tell you right up front. I, I don't know the answer to the question. But it's it's it's, it's the, the, the dilemma is that we know that two doses, two or three weeks apart, works more than ninety percent of the time. Now there's some things we don't know. We don't know how long that lasts. We know it's probably at least eight months, but beyond that, we don't know. We don't know whether all people, particularly elderly people will have the same 90% effectiveness response that younger people have because the number of older people who were tested in the clinical trials was not that great. So the unknowns of diverting from that two dose course a few weeks apart uh, where we do know what the effectiveness is, is leaves some doubt. But I think one might expect, and I think we're gonna get some data on this, that one dose will lead to some immunity and whether it will last as long or be as uh, effective as two doses, we're gonna get that information soon. But right now, the conservative, uh, I use the word advisedly, uh, the conservative thing to do is um, to proceed with the two doses and get that answer quickly. Tony, this is Paul Lava. Um, I wanted to go back to your point about the uh, federal government basically requiring uh, Pfizer and Moderna to, uh, that the federal government own, own the vaccines. Um, and you pointed that as a point of socialism. I, I'm curious to know what you would have considered to be the alternative because I'm not sure I'm very comfortable with the notion that the distribution of, of the vaccines would have been left up to the pharmaceuticals. Um, as we know, the federal government in turn basically has pretty much left it up to the individual states to uh, come up with their own policy on, in terms of the distribution of the vaccines. And I'm at a loss to understand what the alternative to the government not requiring taking ownership of those vaccines in terms of how it would have rolled out if it were left to the individual pharmaceuticals to establish that policy. I agree with you. <laughs> I, I wanted to point out that, um, and the point of making the analogy to socialism was that sometimes we're surprised at what effective government policy entails. And uh, I think in this case, it was the correct policy to do given the circumstances. I mean, one of the other ways it could have done this was um, uh, to use what's uh, been on the books for a long time, the Defense Production Act, to essentially order companies uh, to make the vaccine uh, without mm -hmm. the ownership. Right. And, and I think that's another possibility. Uh, but um, no, I, I think it was up against it, and it's to the credit of the policymakers who came up with Operation Warp Speed um, to, uh, to have the have the federal government on it. And one other, sort of a sour note for Operation Warp Speed, just to show you how much the companies had a role. 
uh, usually the person who heads up something like Operation Warp Speed is called a director. In this case, uh, Ramit Slowey, I'm not sure I have it pronounced this word, who's the chief financial, the chief advisor of Operation Warp Speed, gave up his seat on the board of Moderna the day before he was appointed chief advisor. So you can be sure that the companies are playing a role in Operation Warp Speed and what, uh, why, as I say, I think that this uh, was a, um, uh, a generous offer, the paying of uh, billions of dollars to these co corporations who manufacture the vaccine. Thanks. Have uh, Pfizer and Moderna maintained copyright protection on these products? Well, I think the matter is patenting, not um, copyright oh. protection. All right. Um, and I, I, I don't know, but I can't believe that very quickly there are already many pi files patent and whether the um, the role of the government owning the doses. The, the government doesn't own the, the model for manufacturing the vaccine. It, own, it bought doses. And the question is, uh, if Pfizer or Moderna wants to sell doses to other companies with which, it, uh, with, with, the, with which there is no agreement about ownership, it can do it. Um, so there are great limits to the fact that what is owned is doses of the vaccine, but not the process by which the vaccine is manufactured, which I'm sure every company has very quickly, has many patents already, but I can't swear to it. I don't know. I haven't looked into that uh, to protect their, their uh, invention. Just, just to point out, that's another argument against why the government owning the doses would not fall into the category of socialism because it does not provide the means of production. It simply is, is the product of the production that the government is effectively owned, just as it owns the product of production when we buy tanks and uh, missile launchers and airplanes and all of those other things that the government owns. Thank you, I agree, yeah. Tony, um, what's going to happen if AstraZeneca comes up in a, another three weeks with a vaccine, but it's uh, 55 or 60% effective. Um, will that, what will happen to that? Uh, most people will not want to get that vaccine, uh, hoping to get the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. You're right. <laughs> I, I don't know what will happen. And I think that, um, uh, supply is going to indicate that, that um, I, I really just, I'm not sure whether people will have a choice. I mean, the choice may be get the AstraZeneca if it stays at that low level and um, uh, take your chances or get nothing until uh, the more supposedly more effective vaccine makes a difference. Now, I have to say there are other reasons why AstraZeneca is a, more, is a better vaccine. Uh, and that is because of its stability. You know, we learned, and I, this goes back to something I mentioned at the start about an, MR, an mRNA, a messenger RNA basis for the vaccine, which is this Pfizer and Moderna vaccine versus a DNA uh, basis for, excuse me, for the vaccine, which is the basis for the AstraZeneca, presumably less effective vaccine. But um, storing a vaccine uh, and we've already seen problems with this and a uh, one uh, arrest uh, for failing to keep the Pfizer vaccine at minus 70 degrees centigrade. Now this is, happens to be a factor for mRNA vaccine. So it would apply, although the Moderna vaccine does not require minus 70, it still requires deep freezing of the vaccine. Whereas the AstraZeneca this only requires refrigeration, and that reflects the fact probably that it's a DNA-based vaccine and not an mRNA-based vaccine. So we're not sure yet, um, and this requires follow-up, 
uh, what in FDA parlance is called post-market surveillance, where you follow people who get a drug or who get a vaccine to see how effective and how safe it is, um, that um, people who think they're protected against the vaccine may have been given ineffective, inactive uh, vaccine because it did not, uh, was not protected, preserved under adequate position, position adequate, uh, adequate situations, namely deep freeze minus 70 degrees centigrade. So uh, yeah, that's a sort of a dilemma that's faced, but um, I would rather, and if you're in a remote area uh, in the United States where deep freezes minus 70 is not your ordinary freezer compartment in your refrigerator, um, where that, that kind of storage is not available. So there may be no other choice. Uh, did you suggest that mRNA uh, RNA is inherently requires that deep freeze? Well, remember what's happening in the course of being vaccinated. The vaccine uh, is injected and uh, it finds its way inside cells where it then uses the cellular machinery to uh, replicate. And so the virus is not the entire virus, it's the spike protein of the virus, which is sufficient to give antibodies to the spike protein of the virus, which is then sufficient to prevent the virus from replicating inside cells. So um, inside cells, there's always mRNA. The cell's own mRNA is there to produce the proteins that the cells normally needs for functioning. And when they're finished replicating, um, they're destroyed very rapidly. We don't want them sticking around. And that applies to the mRNA of the vaccine itself. Um, whereas DNA uh, has more protection, double-stranded DNA made from the virus is thought to have greater viability with inside cells and to reduce the destruction within cells of the mRNA of the vaccine of the virus of the spike protein. Uh, the deep freeze slows down cellular metabolism so that would be much less under deep freeze conditions. That, that problem aside, do you believe mRNA offers an opportunity for potential future um, pandemics? Definitely. Okay. Uh, for one thing, it's much easier to manufacture. I mean, not, not easier to preserve, but uh, much easier to manufacture. It may be really could revolutionize uh, mm. vaccine production in general. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, that's my answer. Tony, this is John Gordon. Uh, uh, I have two related questions to ask you. The first is that if you go back to the uh, you know, middle of March, uh, the first pronouncements that came out uh, talked about bending the curve so that there would not be a overloading of the uh, hospital system, either any one place or throughout the country. Uh, and there was never, and I have yet to hear anything subsequently, there was never any discussion as to whether the spatial extent of, uh, if the curve got bent so that it didn't break, whether the spatial extent of those people that were infected would actually end up being less uh, uh, if the curve was sufficiently bent. Uh, and uh, I'm curious, A, as to whether uh, you have any uh, thoughts on that, because I thought the fact that nobody said that by bending the curve, we're also going to reduce the social, the, uh, the spatial extent of the people infected, the fact that nobody said it told me that nobody thought that was possible. Uh, uh, so that's question A. Question B is, what, if any, view do you have, if I've got the name right, about the, the Barrington Coalition of Medical Experts that thought that there ought to be an explicit focus on keeping the 
um, uh, sort of uh, people with comorbidities of which I am one. Uh, uh, so let me state that, uh, you know, keep them safe and allow everybody else to get on with life. Uh, can you help me with either or both of those questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so the first question about bending the curve. I think it's more appropriate, and I think the term that, that I prefer, and I think that was often used, was flattening the curve. So if you see... Yeah, yeah, flattening the curve, yes. I uh, apologize, flattening I the curve. I think if you look at the curve that people are talking about, it's sort of a bell-shaped curve uh, yeah. among infections in the population. So in, in, instead of uh, having a, a peak, so to speak, you actually lower the area under the curve. And the area right. under the curve is the total number of people who will be infected. And I believe right. that, uh, and if you lower the number of people who will be infected one way or the other, then you can um, reduce um, the severity of the pandemic. Uh, and I, so yes, I think that if you did, if we did succeed in flattening the curve, and that was what I was trying to show you with those separate peaks, the surges, as that went up in the spring and um, fall, uh, that we would have reduced the pandemic now, but without a vaccine, it would have meant, I believe, unless the, the virus wore itself out, and we can talk, we'll talk about herd immunity when we come to the second question, um, that uh, it would have been effective, but it would have taken contact tracing and quarantine. We would have had to vigorously go out of people, go after people, a bad way to put it, uh, who had tested positive, look at their contacts, uh, those who test positive, look at their contacts and so on. So I think there was a, by contact tracing, we could have um, flattened the curve and reduced the uh, pandemic, but without um, vaccines, we would have had to continue for a long time, unless, as I say, the virus wore itself out. Uh, mm -hmm. We would have continued safe distancing, masks, et cetera, et cetera, far into the future. Um, now, the second question about the Barrington Declaration, and thank you for reminding me uh, what it was. Before I discovered the Adirondacks many, many years ago, I spent my summers in camp in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. <laughs> so I'm at least familiar with the geography uh, of, of the place. But I think this, again, rests on the matter of herd immunity, um, that eventually, uh, if you got up to, and scientists say um, 70 to 80% of people would have to be actively immune to the virus, that then the virus would find it difficult to find a home for itself within cells that were not resistant to it and would wear itself out that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a fallacy of the Barrington um, uh, Declaration, that it's not possible. And even with, with vaccines now, I mean, again, I, shouldn't have, I should have made this point. I want to make it strongly. That's going to take at least a year, at least a year, before we come anywhere approaching that, and probably much longer. And in that period, the same as is the case for flattening the curve without a vaccine, that people are going to have to wear masks, safe distance, uh, limit their contacts with others, so that it's not an easy uh, road to hoe. Uh, we will have to be very careful over the next, over 2021 for sure. Hmm. Thank you. Tony, just, just to follow up on that, because that, I think you said something that just uh, sort of sent a chill down my spine. You say that with even with the vaccine, you see us living much in this same way with masks and social distancing for the next 12 months? Is that your prediction? I, I don't have any great insight into how long it's going to be, but at the rate things are going, um, I think it, 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 it the, the point I want to make is you can't, we can't let our guard down now. We can't simply because the vaccine is there, whether it's in our arms or not. Uh, we've still got several months at least before we are able to reduce um, the evidence. And I think we're gonna see, we're seeing it now, we're in the middle of a, sort of, a, of a third spike or a second and a, a, second and a half spike uh, after New Year's holidays. So um, yeah, I'm not optimistic about the speed with which we can let our guard down. 
isn't that a function of how many arms are, are involved? Look, the United States has 330 million population. Uh, we have not yet uh, tested. I, I don't know that I've seen the latest figures, but not, we haven't, I don't think yet tested 20 million people. I mean, there are a lot of doses of the vaccine sitting around. They're not in people's arms yet. So, um, and there have been problems with distribution. There have been problems, like I said, with the stability of the vaccine uh, that may lead to inactive vaccine in some cases. So, um, sorry, I can't be more optimistic. Have the EUAs for the, uh, the bad tests been withdrawn at this point? Oh, no. No. So anybody can get into this business and make a, a fallacious test. Well, that's what happened. It's actually uh, reported back in April, a consortium, a private consortium that admitted uh, off mic that they didn't know what they were doing. A consortium contracted with the governments of Utah, Iowa, Tennessee, and Nebraska to provide testing and it soon became apparent that they didn't know what they were doing and their test was much less effective uh, in terms of false uh, because there were more false positives and more false negatives than other labs in those states that were testing uh, in fact one of the people involved with the test wanted to link the test to the giving of people who did test positive to give them the um, uh, anti-malarial and the, the chloroquine uh, administration which is subsequently proved to be totally ineffective uh, and yet they wanted it but that's more. about as good as the gmp testing that was done <laughs> yeah. well but it's a whole series of other problems that comes up when you really have very relaxed regulation virtually no regulation at all um that I answer the question yes tony, tony i wanted to ask a, i wanted to ask a question about Right now, there's been very few people that's been vaccinated in the United States. Um, that That's going to change over time. And perhaps by summer, um, perhaps by the end of summer, there'll be, a, there'll be a larger part of the population that should have been vaccinated. And that's going to raise an interesting question as to what the behavior of, of the two groups are going to be at that point. There'll be a group of people who have been vaccinated and perhaps feel that they're able now to move more freely among the general population. Um, and those that have not been vaccinated who will continue to practice uh, isolation and social distancing and things like that. Uh, it, it's gonna make for an interesting social interaction at that point because we'll have We'll have basically two groups of the population at that point, um, uh, kind of following their own their their own behaviors. Um, perhaps we already have that now with the masks and you know the the mask and the anti masks. But it's going to be more interesting when we have a, a, a good number of of the population vaccinated in terms of behaviors. Um, will people start traveling again? Will because they will planes be full of vaccinated people? Um, I don't, I don't know. I think it's a great point. Uh, thank you for, for bringing it up. I mean, again, it gets to what I concluded with the question of what do you do in a democracy where, you know, people have this freedom to behave differently and can believe, well, I've got it, I'm protected. Um, I can be careless. And, uh, you know, and that was a sort of a little mini Trump thing because uh, Trump didn't really care whether he got other people infected or not. In fact, interestingly, after it became clear when he had this uh, when he introduced um, uh, Amy Barrett uh, for the Supreme Court at the Rose Garden famous Rose Garden ceremony where he might have been infecting other people and there was originally talk when that became apparent of they're doing contact tracing to see who he might have affected and they called it off the White House called it off they did not contact trace trace the people who were in the Rose Garden when he might have infected them so yeah, I think the way people go and the freedom that we get is a very important and serious question for the future of democracy. Tony, Jay here. With the 
vaccine as effective as it is, I'm not sure I really comprehend the issue. Once everybody who wants to get vaccinated is, uh, it seems to me the only people who might get infected who aren't willing to take the risk would be, uh, you know, 10% or less for whom the vaccine didn't work, although they would probably have a, a mitigated case. Uh, and those people that can't get it because uh, either they're immunocompromised, uh, if that's really an issue with this vaccine. So those who will get infected are those that choose not to get the vaccine. So what is the problem with that? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I, sounds like Charles Dickens, you know, if we want to <laughs> get rid of the excess population, you know. Well, uh, I don't think that we, any of us would make that choice. I think we would be a very high risk group. Um, I think getting there, um, you know, is, is a major problem, Jay. Um, it's not so we, but I, we'll see. And I, I don't know, you know, it, it's the flu vaccines. Remember when we're talking about uh, effectiveness of vaccine, the flu vaccines are about 50 to 60% effective. And the, it, effectiveness, because usually the flu mutates and changes from year to year, that's the principal reason why we have to be vaccinated or some of us have to be vaccinated uh, every year for flu. Um, there's already been a mutation uh, starting in UK apparently where the infectivity already high to begin with became much higher after this mutation. So there, uh, it's hard to see, it's hard for me or any scientist to look forward that far to see how the virus is gonna behave, how people are gonna behave and to know what's wrong with that. I hope, you know, you were right. If we continue to have a vaccine or vaccines that are 90% effective, that we eventually get to getting, to getting 70 or even 80% of the population vaccinated, that herd immunity will kick in and that we don't have much to worry about. But that's a, uh, that's a far ahead of us. We're nowhere near reaching that now. Now we have the capacity. I mean, if you look at all the 100 million doses that the government has, owns, uh, if they're effective, uh, it's got enough to do it as they can be produced. Uh, and, and let's hope that um, the problem does obey. But it's hard to know right now. Hi, uh, this is Elizabeth. Um, I just had a question. Uh, I've talked to a couple of doctors who have told me that the vaccine for the coronavirus will prevent uh, those who get it from getting seriously ill with COVID-19, but it won't prevent the spread of the actual virus. Is that accurate? I can't see how it's accurate. Um, I think it, it, uh, the matter of the first question of how ill somebody will get with the virus is not really completely answered yet, if they get ill at all. Um, and I mentioned earlier that whether it's a high risk groups uh, will um, be completely protected or protected from a severe form. I don't think we know yet. It should hopefully be an all or nothing to get. If you don't get infected uh, and you don't get sick, or you do, uh, but we don't know that yet. Um, so far as, what was the other part of your question? The second, could you repeat what you, the second part you asked? Oh, I just said that uh, from what I've heard from local doctors recently, um, the idea is that a person would be vaccinated and that vaccination would prevent them from becoming seriously ill with COVID-19 but it wouldn't prevent them from being able to uh, still be infected and spread the coronavirus. Is that accurate? If I think the first part I did answer, but the second part is um, if you're vaccinated, um, you don't spread the vaccine, you don't spread the virus. Once you, the, the vaccine takes hold, you develop antibodies and other uh, immune responses you don't um, 
uh, you don't spread the virus. It can't replicate in you. That's the point. You prevent it from replicating and preventing it from getting to the point uh, where um, it, won't, it won't spread to others. Now, it may be there's some evidence that suggests that the, the amount of virus you have contributes to the seriousness of the disease. So I can, it's conceivable that if you had a very minimum amount of virus present because of the vaccine, uh, that you might communicate it, but I haven't seen any um, evidence. And in the clinical trials, people were being tested. Uh, every subject in the trial was being tested for the virus, whether they were symptomatic or not. So I think it would greatly reduce the success of the vaccine if people were able to spread it. And then once it spread to proliferate in the host to the point where the person would become sick with the virus. I haven't seen any evidence to that. Thanks. We still don't know how long immunity lasts, right? I, I meant to say that, yes, that's a good point. Um, uh, there, we do know that it probably is effective for eight months. After that, there just is not enough data yet to say how long after that it will last. So that's another thing, it goes back to Jay's question, you know, about whether you know, you get out to the point where we've got 80% of the um, uh, population vaccinated, uh, whether they're going to need a new round of vaccine to prolong uh, immunity. So that's another a good, good point. Yeah, just about the time that we have a, a good number of people who have received the vaccine, its effectiveness starts to wear out on the early... <laughs> Cohort. No. We hope that, you know, the matter of herd immunity at that point, we hope that that changes. Remember, we're li living in, in a very dynamic environment. And, you know, that, we may at that time encounter another virus. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I think that our approach, um, which was downgraded, President Trump, before the, before in 2019, before the epidemics hit, the Trump administration reduced the uh, early warning systems for biological uh, disease, particularly infections. So that for many years, we have lived in disregard of what um, infectious disease experts were telling us was a likely event to happen. And, you know, as you move away from this epidemic, there's always, again, in the long run, the possibility of letting our guard down that other things take priority. And yet this is going to happen again. Tony, Sorry to end on Tony, a... I, one thing I just wanted to ask about is, you know, it seems like we, today, we've talked a lot about the United States. And in the press, you hear a lot about the pandemic response in the United States. But um, we, I, I'm surprised at how little we're hearing about what um, access there is going to be or is today in, in the developing world for, for vaccines. And what do you, do you see the United States playing a role in that? I mean, you hear about China is, is really kind of leading the effort there with a vaccine that hasn't been fully tested, which is concerning, I think. What do you think the United States is going to do going forward? Are we just going to be worrying about our own population or are we going to try to help the rest of the world? Well, uh, that's uh, at the beginning of a new administration, I, I think it's pretty clear uh, that the, the Biden administration is concerned about uh, worldwide distribution of the virus. What it can do about it uh, and what it will do, I, I don't know. But the um, United States, um, has a very mixed record of how it stands. And of course, isolationism uh, is a strong historical feature in uh, American foreign policy before World War II. Uh, and that's not so far away that I can't remember it. I can remember it um, vaguely. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, unquestionably, Americans will say, you know, we need to get vaccinated. And in terms of number of people in the world, I mean, we, we, the United States, I don't remember the percentage of the world population 
that we are, but we're right now uh, having a much higher percentage of all COVID-19 infections worldwide than we are in terms of our percentage of the world's population. So, I mean, it's not unreasonable that right now what the American, what the policy is at the moment of getting as many as, as many of Americans in, in vaccinated as possible is not an unreasonable one. But I, and again, I mean, what we've done is turn our backs on the World Health Organization. We have withdrawn from the World Health Organization. That's certainly something that should be reversed and that the Biden administration will reverse. Um, so we have to be more cooperative and we've benefited from um, if you look at it, if you look at what China did, whatever you can say about how they can curb their epidemic and their various reports of how much, uh, uh, how much uh, freedom was lost in getting China to contain its epidemic. But the fact is that they've done it and they've been very generous uh, in terms of making the sequence available very early on. It was already the tail end of their epidemic but um, they were very generous in making the sequence available to other people, other countries, so that we could have a, a, an effective test and then a vaccine. So Amy, I, um, uh, that's my answer. Equivocal. Amy's question is, it's the pan side of <laughs> epidemic, right? It's the pan side that's really the issue. I mean, uh, uh, we could be fine if we were indeed an isolated uh, society. Um, then, then the rest of the world, whatever they do, they do. But we're not so isolated, in fact. So, yeah. no, I, I agree. And I, it's, it's a global economy right now. Yep. Yep. Hey, Tony, I wanted to ask you about, you, you uh, commented earlier about your own decision about getting uh, vaccinated and uh, your history with, uh, uh, I, I think you mentioned um, allergic reactions and things like that. And you seem to be putting off uh, getting the vaccine. I'm curious to know what your thought process is or what, what you're waiting to see change that will put you in a better position to make, make that decision for yourself. Well, listen, I, uh, as I said at the very start, I mean, we're all, I mean, I'm looking, I see uh, white faces. Uh, we're all relatively protected and I am highly protected. When the, when the pandemic started, I have a daughter and her family with whom I share a duplex in California. We made a decision and they have young kids, kids still in school. Uh, and they could both, the parents could both work at home, that we would isolate as a unit. So I have children and grandchildren. Um, I don't work, obviously. I go shopping, I wear a mask. Sometimes I go when elderly people are supposed to go. Um, but I'm uh, relatively protected and I'm obviously not suffering. And I mean, the remarkable thing is that uh, I have never encountered a patient, and I should make this clear as disclosure, I've never had a patient with COVID-19. I don't have patients anymore. I'm retired. And I was able to look at all the data that you've seen in front of my computer. I mean, uh, looking at FDA documents, CDC documents, Googling questions of various types. And it's absolutely mind-blowing to me uh, from the point of view of how investigational journalism or reporting can be done and some science too without leaving your desk so i don't feel a great that i'm suffering by not being vaccinated but i i will event that's going to change but it's also interesting and we can all speculate about how what happened this year uh in all its aspects is going to influence how we look at the future and how we go into the future thanks Tony, I may have missed the point. Do you have insight into FDA's decision-making early on, especially as it relates to the testing protocols? Uh, was that, was that as, as obvious as it might be, was that politically driven? Uh, was it just bad decision-making on the part of the FDA? 
it's hard to know. Um, I think it was pretty clear that um, Trump himself, you know, had no great love lost with uh, seeing uh, public entities, CDC, health departments, manage testing when uh, there was an opportunity for the private sector to step in. Um, I think this was, um, I'm not privy to how um, Stephen uh, Hahn, the commissioner of FDA, and his uh, friends there made a decision. I just, I, how much Trump was in, influenced that decision, how much Azar, the chair, the um, secretary of HHS said, I just don't know, but <laughs> you can use your own political imaginations to surmise what might have happened. Uh, yeah, I, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry and I'm shocked by FDA dropping its I mean, I, I faced FDA on the other side of the table, you know, uh, as it related to GMPs and things like that. And I it just, it, it mind boggles me that FDA was casual about this whole thing. The incredible thing now, and I've talked to people at FDA, actually FDA and FDA press representatives left me in the document. There's an FDA document that's online that shows you all of the companies up to today that have received EUAs for testing and for a variety of other things too, including the vaccine. Um, and how this waiver that I talked about is absolutely mind blowing where you don't have to follow good manufacturing practices. A absolutely. Remains on the books. I mean, that is an astounding document. Yeah. You can all look at. Um, you have to go through some little rigmarole on your computer to get to it, but it's there and it stays on the books, how they could be so blind. You know, I, I'm worried that the next time I go back and look at that data, it's gonna be erased. I'm very worried they're gonna to try to remove it retroactively. Uh, FDA will try to remove that data. It's extraordinary to me. And I, I hope you realize it's shocking data to see those EUAs with that waiver. I did a random sample of them and uh, in every one, the same Roman numeral three waiver. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, uh, I'm just curious if there's any correlation between our standard American diet, sad diet, with our incidence of COVID. I haven't, I haven't seen any data. I mean, and that's a, the standard American diet has a very wide variation around it. So it's hard to know. I mean, among the factors that affect uh, poor people, um, African-Americans, uh, Hispanics, uh, I don't know whether the kind of diet that might be more prevalent among those groups has played any role. I think there are many more important factors they're living in crowded circumstances. They're forming a much larger number of essential workers than their percentage in the population uh, make them more prone to um, becoming infected. Uh, and also the, uh, you know, the, the difficulty of getting care early. So many of them are, are dying from it. That those seem to be more important factors associated with high incidence of the disease than diet. But who knows? A higher prevalence of multi-generational living, too, I think. Of course, I think, yeah, poor living. All of those things, I would say, are uh, parallels with our history. Um, it sounded, you could have been Dr. Trudeau just now, Tony, um, describing describing some of the, pro the causes of tuberculosis or the reasons for its spread. So yeah. Um, yeah. it's interesting how history all comes back around again. And uh, I, I just want to... Before I let folks go, put in a little plug for the next uh, article from Historic Saranac Lake. We were doing a letter from the porch every week, which became um, somewhat um, onerous <laughs> to try to put those out every single week. And we're down to one a month now. Um, but I'm working on the one for this month. And it's, uh, I should probably show it to you, Tony, and you can, you can catch some any errors or things that I've missed. But um, it's a conversation at St. John's in the Wilderness Graveyard between the three doctors, Trudeau. 
um, getting their perspective on what we're going through today. So hopefully, hopefully it'll tell you a few things you don't know. Um, it's, uh, it's been a fun one to work on. So um, with that, I'm gonna just let everybody um, have a chance to, to say goodbye. Tony, you've been here with us for an hour and a half now. So for a man who's retired, that's a, that's a lot of work in all at once. Thank you so much uh, for spending, taking your time and for all the work you did the, researching this topic and the, the article that you wrote, which I hope you can share. Can we share that with the group when that gets published? I can send you the link. Okay. Easy, to, and then you can get it online. It's in published, it has been published, by the way. It was published last week. Okay. 